So let's move on to Netbox. Um, Netbox, again, if I go, ooh, let's see, Netbox homepage, client, well, we, okay, we can at least do this. I mean, there's, there's a GitHub page and then there's a read the docs page. So Netbox, what is Netbox? I'll just read this to you and then I'll tell you a few reasons of why this appeals to me. What is Netbox? Open source web application, truly open source. I haven't paid a dime for it and it's so far from what I've seen, quite powerful. Uh, it's designed to help you manage and document computer networks, originally conceived by the network engineering team at DigitalOcean, right? Jeremy Stretch is a big part of that, uh, was a big part of that team. He's over at Network to Code now and still is lead developer on Netbox as far as I know, or at least one of them. Netbox was developed to specific developed specifically to address the needs of, of network and infrastructure engineers. And it gives you IPAM and racks and devices, connections, virtualization, data circuits, and secrets. Right, it's got all of that stuff in it. And uh, I've spent mm, a few hours working with it. I've done some data imports. I've done some manual keying of a variety of different things. And let me give you a look at what we've got here. So first of all, let me comment on the installation process of Netbox. It is very well documented. So if I go back to you know, installing Netbox here, they give you directions for um, Ubuntu and another distro. I forgot what the other distro was. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Oh, CentOS, that's right, that's the other one. Um, I installed an Ubuntu just because Ubuntu seems to be, for Linux distributions, the common denominator these days. Almost any open source project you want to try probably has directions for Ubuntu or, or an Ubuntu-like system with the same package managers and stuff. So installation then, when I did this, it took me a bit. There's a lot of steps to it. It's not like run the package manager, apt get install, netbox, and off it goes. I mean, there is some of that. Uh, there are some manual steps that you need to go through as well. And, and they walk you through it just fine. You're gonna go through, once you've got your Ubuntu box built, and I, I did Ubuntu, um, again, 1804, I believe, you're gonna install Postgres and, uh, and stand up the database, and you've got some steps to do for that to create the database and the user for the database and so on. Then you're gonna install Netbox and there's all these different packages you gotta install for Netbox and a bunch of steps and, you know, and things you need to do for that. Just walk through them one at a time, it's fine. Uh, you're gonna get to a point finally where you're gonna integrate what Netbox is installed and the engine that it creates and have that served up to you through either Apache or Nginx. I chose Nginx. Uh, I'm trying to get away from Apache and use Nginx a little more just for something different. I've been using Apache for a very long time, um, going all the way, way back to the day of my days as a data services engineer at an ISP. Um, but a bit of Nginx is um, uh, just something, something different to try and to be honest with you, the config files look like, awfully familiar. Uh, if you're used to Apache, so it wasn't like it's a you know, radical change. But when you stand up uh, this paragraph within Nginx, it's uh, actually acting as, um, as a proxy. It's uh, that where Netbox is sitting there listening locally and serving up web pages with its own little engine. It looks like Nginx is actually going in and pulling those and uh, serving them up to you. And, uh, and that threw me, uh, you know, for a minute because I wasn't, I got to this part, I restarted Nginx, and Netbox didn't launch. And I was like, what's happening? Why isn't that working? I was very sad. And uh, you know, the, the bottom line is there's other services that you need to enable to get all that working. So if you, you get a little excited like I did, and uh, you get the paragraph in Nginx and restart Nginx and Netbox isn't there yet, it's because you're not done. You haven't finished the installation process. See it through to the end and you'll be fine. Uh, anyway, it walks you through all that stuff. I did not do the optional LDAP because I don't have an AD box sitting here. I don't have an LDAP server uh, sitting here where I'm integrating my authentication scheme for Netbox into an LDAP scheme. Yeah, maybe at some point, um, but you know, uh, anyway. Now from there, you, you are in the situation of once you've got it all up and running, I don't need to walk you through all of it because you can read it yourself. You're all grown up. They explain to you their objects 
Um, now this is important for NetBox, if you're gonna, gonna use NetBox. Everybody that manages a data center manages it somewhat differently, but we all have pretty common problems. And what I think the NetBox team has done is really thoroughly thought out how to create a schema and objects that interrelate with one another in that schema in such a way that the vast majority of us are gonna be able to map our network and data center environments into it, but you gotta put, invest the time into understanding their object name the dependencies and how they all are meant to work together, it is clearly uh, written down here in Read the Docs. Spend the time, get a handle on that. You need to understand what an aggregate is and a rear and prefixes and IP addresses in their parlance and what you need to use and not use. And that seems tedious, but what I've done is just as I've been creating objects, I've gone uh, over to this documentation here and spent time to understand how they intend for me to use this so that I use it correctly and so that it works as expected. Uh, if you just try to go on your intuition, it's like a lot of things, you'll get, you're gonna get, be scratching your head because something doesn't work the way it's, it's in your mind you think it's supposed to. Um, you, you need to, again, spend the time with how the NetBox team has put this solution together, understand it, and then it'll all come together for you. So let me show you my NetBox installation here. It's just, just a bunch of lab stuff. It's not done, but I, I thought I'd show you at least what I've gotten entered into the system thus far. Organizationally, you start with sites. Well, I physically am resident in New Hampshire. Most of you know that. It's not much of a secret if you've been listening to the podcast for any number of years. Um, I don't have a, a lot of detail to put in under that, but you can see I could have put in a particular facility, region, uh, tenant or tenants um, could, are supported here in these different sites. I could put in my BGP ASN if that was relevant and so on. Very simple for me just to have you know, the name and hierarchically what I've got here you know, for that site. I don't have anything broken down into regions. I don't need that. I'm basically using NetBox just to support my lab environment. So it's a very simple kind of an install. They give me racks. Okay, I've got one rack that I'm working on documenting here. And you can see this kind of lovely layout. I have a standard 42U rack that is down in my basement with all of my wiring comes into that. I've got my storage array in that. I've got some uh, switches and et cetera all in that. And I've begun the process of documenting what's in here. Uh, in, in this interface. And that's kind of a nice reference um, to see what's in here, what RUs you've got free. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty handy. Um, you can describe what the rack is. This is a four post cabinet. It's 19 inches wide. It's 42U high. And there's more detail you could put in if you want. So that's, you know, that's some physical infrastructure. Now maybe more interesting because some of you are going, I don't want to track what's inside the rack. Or some of you are going, I already have a tool that does this. Mm, maybe you would uh, you know, prefer NetBox. You know, how good is that tool that you're using from HP or APC or you know, whatever it might be. There's pros and cons to a lot of this stuff. Uh, and again, NetBox is open source and it doesn't suck. So something to keep in mind. Devices, so here, this is actually interesting to talk through how you get to the point of a device. Uh, and I'm going to work through it backwards. So if I start with the device, like here's several devices that I've, I've, I've created here. This one is, um, that's, a, that's a switch, okay? So let's look at this switch. Well, what do I need to know before I can actually create this device. Well, this device has got um, a device type. Oh, uh, and that's a required thing. And before I can create the device, I have to have that device type or, or, or um, uh, it won't let me, NetBox won't let me create the device. Oh, okay, so I, I device types. Well, here's a bunch of device types that I've created. And, you know, here's, here's that device type. Oh, well, what do I need before I can actually create a device type? Well, I, I need a manufacturer, and Net, NetBox isn't going to let me create a, a device type without the manufacturer of the device. Oh, okay, so let me go to you know, manufacturers here. Now, here's a bunch of manufacturers and things that they, they create um, or that, that are there. So here's my manufacturer, D-Link. And here's the device type. Well, this is a D-Link. Um, that's the model name of this uh, Ethernet switch that I'm modeling that happens to live in my rack. So I, I give all of that to illustrate there are dependencies within NetBox and you need to understand what the dependencies are as you're going through the creation process or you're going to find yourself scratching your head and backing out. And again, going back to the documentation, um, 
is going to help you understand how all of this works, what a device type is, what a manufacturer is, uh, component templates, other things that you can add to this, and then adding devices. It tells you all the dependencies and the requirements, etc., so that you can create the kind of objects you want to create. And once you're used to it, it makes sense. And then the more you think about it, you realize it couldn't have been done any other way. This is this makes sense. This is the way this is really intended to work, and you're kind of you know glad of it. So. If I go back to this device, here's a specific device. Again, it's, it's got a name, it's got a device type. I say where in the rack it lives. It's in unit 40, it appears in the front. And if I were to go back to the rack here, Lab 01, oh, unit 40 in the front, you know, there it is. You can see uh, see the device. You can store things like serial numbers, um, management, the, you know, the primary IP. This happens to be the primary IP for this uh, switch so I can manage uh, this device. So you can put that in there. And then I'm scrolling down to the bottom of the page here. Here's all the interfaces. Now, how did those interfaces show up in here? I imported them. Netbox does not do device discovery. It is not an SNMP polar. You can't point it at a management IP and say, there's a device, please import it, Netbox. No, that's not how this works. It does not do any of that stuff. You are going to be importing things um, to make this happen. So I actually built a CSV in accordance with Netbox guidelines on what the fields are and what the parameters are within a field. It took me a bit of scratching my head and trying different things and having several different failed imports because I didn't get my CSV formatting right or some field formatting right. And then finally, I made Netbox happy. Turns out again, reading the documentation helped super much, yeah. Uh, and then I ended up with all of these interfaces in here. Now these interfaces are objects that I can work with and you see a few of them are highlighted in green. Uh, oh, like this one. Well, what's, what, what's happened here? What is this? Well, you see this icon? Um, the, it's red and has the two arrows kind of going this way. Um, and then up above it, just to, to contrast, there's it's green and, and the arrows are going this way. Um, that's so you can connect one interface to another interface. That's, that's, how that is, um, that's how that's working. And it turns out this Ethernet 1044 on this device, which is this, this switch, right? Called uh, uh, HL95 Home Switch they are plumbed uh, together. I have connected them together. Uh, so there's this host called Firewall and this interface IGB2. Okay, let me click through. Um, here's this device I've generically called Firewall. <laughs> uh, super, super interesting name. It's a device, it's got, uh, if I scroll down to the bottom, oh, here's four interfaces, look at that. Now I didn't import those four interfaces because there was just four of them. I created them manually, although I didn't have to create them one at a time. There's a way you can give it a range. You can give Netbox a range when you're creating interfaces for a device and it'll, it'll iterate through the range and create several of them for you, which I found super intuitive. Um, it, it worked very, it worked really slick. And, uh, and oh, lo and behold, there's the other, there's my IGP2 interface, and there's the device, and there's the interface it's connected to on the other end. Now, if you're looking at all this and going, geez, Banks, that's tedious. Um, yeah, it is a little bit. Um, but again, if the goal is to have for, ultimately for automation, a source of truth, for your physical infrastructure and for your IP addressing. Well, there's gonna be some tedium on the front end getting data into this system, creating data sets that you can import and then sticking with it and using it once you've, been, uh, once you've done the importation. It's gonna be a process, it's gonna be some, some operational transformation there. I like that for some buzzwords for you. So let's look at the IPAM part of this here. Uh, we've got uh, aggregates, rears, um, so if I look at, let's start with rears. It's another one of these dependency things. I've got four different rears. Now I have no official allocations from Aaron uh, in this lab. Um, I've got instead um, private RFC 1918 address space, RFC 6598 address space. And then I have a slash 64 and a slash 48 allocated to me by tunnelbroker.net. That's it's Hurricane Electric that they give you basically build an account, you get a slash 48 for free if you uh, click the right buttons there. There's no, no magic to that. So to build an aggregate, you first need to have a rear, all right? 
So I've built those pseudo rears. They're not actually regional internet registrars. They are you know, just representations of that. And then they suggest, uh, the Netbox guy suggests that that's how you come up with them if you don't have an actual uh, rear like Aaron, et cetera, that you're using, you know, call them, call them RFC names, call them whatever. This is where I got you know, my addresses. Now I'm in my aggregate page. These are the big top level um, net blocks that I might be using in my lab at any given time. So I've got 10.000 slash A, 10.64, etc. The, the familiar ones you've seen that you know are you know, available for what you would have typically behind your firewall that you're gonna nat or pat out to the internet, etc. And it's what we all use and have overlapping troubles with and so on. And then I've got a couple of these V6 blocks that I got from Tunnel Broker that are uniquely assigned to my account uh, with Hurricane Electric, uh, again at tunnelbroker.net. Now, uh, beyond that, whoops, in IPAM, I can go from aggregates, the, 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 the supernet containing a bunch of subnets inside of the aggregate would be the, the, the very top level block that you're working with. And now I can go into my prefixes. These prefixes are pulled out of my aggregates. So I've got a couple that I've documented so far. I've got, um, you know, this slash 24 and that slash 24, I've got some IP addresses I've begun documenting. So right now I've got dot one is, uh, is a gateway. It's assigned to the uh, device firewall on the interface IGB one. And I gave it a description. That's just a comment field that I populated with some, so I remember what it is. That's the land facing port in this particular firewall. Then I've got 49 IPs available. Then I've got a whole bunch of IPs that are in a DHCP range. So I labeled them and said, hey, they're type DHCP, et cetera. I, I use DHCP pretty heavily and have static DHCP reservations uh, rather than assigning static IPs. It's, um, it's more flexible that way for me. So there's an example of a IP prefix, okay? Uh, and then you can get down to individual, all of the individual IP addresses and just, and just list them. So I'm walking through all of this, not because you need to memorize each of these screens, but just if you've never seen Netbox, I wanted you to get a sense of what's here and what it's, um, what it's offering to you. There's a lot there and there's a lot I haven't showed you. I can go into you know, even more detail. I can do, I can create virtual clusters and put virtual machines into those clusters. Haven't done that yet, but it's on my list. I'll take the few virtual machines that I've got in my ESXi environment. I think I can map those into this. I don't have clusters as such, but I think if I remember from the documentation, I can make a, a single box cluster, I think, and, uh, and then throw virtual machines into that. Uh, I haven't put any circuits in here because, hey, in this lab environment, I actually don't have circuits other than my internet circuit. So I'll probably document my internet circuit and I connect that in with providers and such. Now, power, you can do power feeds and power panels. I haven't done this yet, but that's another one that I'm interested in. I've got, I think, a 20 amp circuit that's coming into that ramp, maybe a 30 amp circuit, I'd have to check. No, I think it's 20, I don't think it's anything else. I think it's 20, I'm not actually pulling that much power in there uh, anymore anyway. I could pop that in there if I want. Haven't gotten there yet. Secrets. Um, I haven't moved any secrets into Netbox yet. I am using a password manager that allows me to store secrets securely and have done those for things like the Postgres uh, database secret um, that I need to have and, and I did a bunch of other things. You know when you build servers you end up with a bunch of secrets. That's just the, that's just the way of things. Oh, one other thing just popped to mind relating to connecting two interfaces together is you end up with um, cables you create a cable object gets created when you're connecting two devices. You actually have a, a physical cable with an ID that are connecting, like in this case, I'm connecting my VM NIC zero on this ESXi dash one host, that's that HP box I was showing you earlier, to Ethernet 103, for example. And now I've got this cable object. Well, if you've been in a data center that ran cable inventories, this is kind of a big deal. Um, I know a lot of shops that, I, I haven't been in, I haven't worked in this kind of a shop specifically myself, but I know a lot of you guys will make a cable label. Um, maybe it's got a barcode on it and you're gonna attach that to 
the cable and okay you can get that granular with netbox if you want to you really can and then include the type of cable the color of the cable how long is the cable i mean yikes you know you, you ocd people go nuts go go nuts everyone make yourself uh, as happy as you want to and all that kind of stuff uh anyway just point pointing out that that's there as a thing there's there's more here that i can show you i'm just i'm just kind of giving you a taste but the last detail about uh, netbox that i want to show you and where i want to go long term is netbox has an api uh, we've been walking through the gui but the real big magic here is I've got an API that I can take and with Python, whatever, um, that I, is my language of choice where I'm going to do these API calls, I can get all kinds of information out of Netbox programmatically from a CLI. Now, I haven't done any of that yet, but I'm just pointing out it's all here. Look at this. All these methods are sitting here. They're all documented uh, with Swagger. So let me let's see if I can... So they've got DSIM hierarchy. They've got... Um, oh, man, everything is in here. IPAM, IPAM choices, aggregates, IP addresses. Let's see if I... If I get IPAM, IPAM addresses, I'm clicking through here. So here's the whole, here's everything that is available to me from uh, this particular API call, all the different parameters that I can uh, ask for and get back. And I just love that it's all here. There's an example. Here's uh, what I can feed in and uh, the kind of information that I can expect to uh, get back out it's just it's it's really lovely so if you think about netbox in that way that is i can get information out of it programmatically using an api what that means is you're going to spend a bunch of time up front getting data into it you could do it programmatically with the api by the way obviously i'm showing you the gui because that's easy but you know, i could do it that way i could post um, if I had anything in the right um, uh, data format, I can I can import with CSVs as I, uh, as I more easily from the UI if I don't want to get into anything programmatic. But once it's all in there, I don't technically have to use the UI for anything. You know, I can just kind of go back to you know the way things were and stick with the UI if I want. So if I need someone to look up something and they want to use the UI, it's here. This is very usable. It's slick. You know, it's, it's pretty, pretty quick. Uh, everything's intuitive. Everything's organized in a way that makes a lot of sense, and that's fine. But again, the magic is in it programmatically because... Um, so, so let me give you a scenario. I am standing up a new server. New server needs an IP address. Okay, hey, Netbox, what is the next IP address that I can give to this box? And if you wrap the correct logic around it programmatically, you can pull that data out of Netbox. And, uh, and then populate Netbox with that, that IP address that you've assigned to this particular server. How cool is that, right? Um, do you even have to go into Netbox to do that? No, you can have a script that does it for you and keeps the database up to date. That is uh, powerful. That is transformational in how you do your operations. And, uh, and this is the thing when people who have gotten way more into Netbox than I have yet, since I'm fairly new to it, tell me is where all the power is. This is what everyone is really, really, really excited about is the ability to programmatically get data into and out of Netbox. Um, I, I, again, I don't want to beat you to death with the word operational and transformational, but it is a thing where everybody's got to buy into it and say the only right way to get data to and from my infrastructure, you know, all that operational physical uh, information is to use Netbox. Netbox is the source of truth for this. And if something is configured in a way or has an IP address or there's a VLAN that exists that isn't in Netbox, who's the right one? Netbox is. And some of you just went, ooh, that'd be scary because what if, and then there's a million what if scenarios about things that get created outside the bounds of a tool like Netbox. Yeah, exactly. That's the transformational part. And uh, if you listen to recent automation shows we've done within the Packet Pushers Network, you hear that getting people on board with that process is a bigger problem than using the tooling itself. It's getting everyone to standardize on using this tooling. 
Okay, um, so that's NetBox and where I want to go with it uh, in a bit. Another point here related to automation, GNS3 has got an interface that um, I, I'm aware of and that's about it. I haven't tried anything yet. But there's a library that's going to allow me, as I understand it, to stand up labs. Uh, I think I can use Ansible and write a playbook that'll stand a lab up for me. I haven't actually looked into that yet. If it's as simple as, um, you know, as writing up fields, then gosh, that'll be outstanding because I'll just be able to, you know, point an Ansible playbook at GNS3 and poof, you know, a standard baseline lab will appear for me, which would be super handy because when I want to do uh, certain lessons like, oh, okay, today we're going to talk about um, layer three to closet switches, uh, you know, as a conversion from layer two and what that all looks like and why and the pros and the cons. It'd be nice to have just like uh, a campus lab with some closets and some core switches sitting there as a, as a baseline template that you might see. And me not having to go, okay, drag and drop, drag and drop, drag and drop, you know, drag, click, 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 you know, and then make all these things by hand in the GUI, which is fine, but, you know, if I could just, you know, go magic playbook and poof, you know, the lab appears, that'd be outstanding. And, and more trustworthy to me than even trying to save a GNS3 project as my baseline and then, you know, duplicate it over and, you know, and all those things that you would normally do. Well, yeah, that's not so bad, but uh, again, magic button, I, mm, yeah, I like that. So I'm going to spend some time and try to sort that out.